Thank you very much. Good morning. Well, a year ago, I was here and I gave part one of this uh, presentation, this extended presentation. And it was about DDD and robots and then how I came up with a um, kind of an intuitive model of the mind, uh, how I implemented it on, on Lego robots, um, and, and then a discussion about how uh, DDD concepts uh, illuminated both the design and the implementation. There was a, a demonstration of my robots. Actually, there were two robots and their mom played by a laptop, and the robots basically move around, move around, look, looking for food. Food is the white paper on the, on the ground. Under the supervision of their mom, and then they go around and, and, and you know fight for the food a little bit, try to avoid to collide into walls, uh, avoid the, each other, and, and whatnot. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing. All right. So that went pretty well. And then QA, QA happened, and uh, Bruno, Bruno came up with a, a really good question. He asked me, "Can your robots learn?" You know, how would you go about it? I didn't have a good answer. I just like, <laughs> I did not have a good answer. I basically, I had no idea. Now, that was pretty, uh, it was, it was, I didn't feel really good about that. I was pretty, you know, obsessed about, well, maybe I should have had a good idea. Why, why don't I have a good idea of how to introduce learning into my cognitive model since learning is such an important integral part of cognition? So what was wrong with my model? So uh, I went back and I, I looked at my improvised model, and I won't go through the whole thing, but basically I looked at my perceptors, which establish a, a hierarchy of perception, and I said, could learning happen there? But it was just too hard-coded. I looked at my motivators. Motivators decide what should be the current goals of the robot. And same problem. They're just too hard coded. I, there's no, and I can't see how I can introduce learning into this. Attention. Attention is responsible for uh, making sure that only the, the, the sensors that are needed at the time are, are being pulled. Otherwise, the robot would get just overwhelmed with too much, uh, too much sensations. No learning there, actually, especially not there, because it turned out to be rather a big hairball. Then what about behaviors? Behaviors is uh, how the robot uh, accomplishes the goals that the motivator sets as the current goals. But um, not there either, because my uh, behaviors were implemented as finite state machines, driven by uh, perception, per percepts coming in, and the, 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 the finite state machine would emit intentions to act, and, and then the robot would carry out those intentions and whatnot. How do you make a finite state machine learn? I don't know. Do you know? I don't know. So I was, I was, was kind of at a dead end. I felt like I was stuck. I was stuck. So maybe I should do like just about everybody else and look into you know, machine learning and, and, and neural networks. And Now, nah. I, I really wanted a naturalistic solution. I, I wanted my model to kind of mimic the, what the theories in, in cognition are, are uncovering. Well, it so happens that about a month or so later, I was you know, looking through my Twitter stream, and I, and I, found, I followed a link to this blog, the Brains blog, and it talked about this book called Surfing Uncertainty. And the book is about uh, a, 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 a really a, uh, a relatively newish theory in neuroscience called predictive processing, and it's gaining a lot of favor right now. Uh, and, I, and one of the nice things about this, this theory is that it, it integrates perception, action, and learning. And I went, ha, ah, maybe that's the ticket. So I purchased the book, and uh, it's a book written by Andy Clark, Surfing Uncertainty. It's a fantastic book. It's, it's, a, it's a really it's a dense book. It's full of ideas and concepts and a lot of examples, but it's, it's a slow read. So, but I read it twice. I read it very slowly, but I read it twice, and it, it really inspired me. And, and the whole, uh, the, the basic 
idea behind predictive processing is that the brain, and more than the brain, uh, is a prediction machine. That a lot of what the brain does, and maybe the most important thing that the brain does, is trying to predict the sensory input that's coming in. And, and it, the, the predictions it makes about what it's about to receive as, as, as sensory inputs it flows down and meets those sensory inputs. And when the predictions are correct, it stops there. But when the prediction is slightly off, or completely off, prediction errors flow up. So in the end, what reaches your brain is an entirely prediction errors, basically the, the sensory inputs that you had not predicted, that your brain had not predicted, but hopefully there are relatively few of them. Right? So the brain as a, as a, as a prediction engine is, is the core idea behind predictive um, processing. And that, that was really interesting. And what the brain does is essentially is, is an instance of what we call predictive coding. And predictive coding is used in, in video compression. What you do is you, you have a frame, then you have the next frame, but you anticipate what will be in the next frame, and only where you're wrong do you encode that part. What has changed, right? And then the next frame, what did you not anticipate given the previous frames? That's what you encode. It can be pretty simplistic, exactly what's changed from the previous frame. It can be more complex. For example, if, if you're panning a scene, you will expect the panning, and then you will, you will expect everything else to be the same, but then the horses move, so maybe the leg, the part of the leg that's moved, is what you're encoding, basically. So it's a, it's a strategy for uh, minimizing bandwidth. And what the brain does, it does its own form of predictive coding, but what it predicts are the sensory inputs coming in. And if it's good at predicting, then the, the neural bandwidth that get, gets used will be minimal. So the story here is one of neural frugality. How little work can you do, or can, how little work can the brain do, do to get really good information in order to survive, but at a minimal cost? All right. I'm, I'm, I talk about the brain doing predictive processing, but it's, it's also it's all distributed to the nervous system. At near the eyes, there are clusters of cells, and what they do is they predict which photoreceptor is going to be uh, stimulated next, given that others are being simulated. There's a, there's a, a, a dot moving. Well, those clusters of cells will anticipate the, f the, the next receptor to be stimulated, and that will uh, impact the way the, the, the neural information is, is, is transmitted. At the level of the brain, it's a higher scope. We will be predicting uh, what, what will the horse do next. You know, will the leg move? this way or that way. And if your predictions are right, there's very few uh, surprising pieces of information in your brain. But if the, the horse suddenly disappears and is replaced by a starship, there'll be a flurry of prediction errors in your brain. And then you'll recognize the starship that's a starship, and then everything will settle down. That's the idea. Now, predictions alter your perception, right? So look at that image, right? Look at it. I'm going to tell you, it's a Dalmatian. Look at it again. Do you, do you experience it differently? You do. You can't help yourself. Now you see the dog and nothing else. What about this? I'm telling you, it's a cow. Look at it. You can't see it the same way again. Because now your predictive machinery is, is matching you know, the input saying, a cow. You're seeing a cow. So you feel differently. That's visual. Now, if you look in, in the uh, auditory uh, realm, um, if you listen to sp speech from which you remove all the details, so-called sine wave speech, if you listen to it the first time, see if we can make sense of it. Let's listen to it again. OK? Fine. Now let's, look, let's listen to that speech, I mean, with the full signal. The man read the newspaper at lunchtime. Let's listen to it again. The man read the newspaper at lunchtime. Okay, 
the man read the newspaper at lunchtime. Now let's go back to the uh, sine wave speech. You hear it completely differently. That's kind of interesting. And, and that kind of phenomenon is best explained so far by predictive processing. So that's really, really neat, a really neat uh, theory. Now, it, uh, predict predictive uh, processing has more to say than just simply like that kind of perception. It, it can also uh, explain higher level cognitive functions like attention. Imagine you're, you're, you wake up in the morning, it's very foggy, there's not much light, your dog ran away, you're looking for your dog. Are you going to rely on your sight or more on your hearing? You're not going to trust your eyes so much because it's all blurry shapes and whatnot. So you're going to downgrade the prediction errors that come up from your eyes and turn up the gain on the prediction errors that come up from your ears. Basically, you're saying, I'm seeing weird stuff, but I don't pay attention to it, but I'm going to listen very closely for the sound of my dog. And that's the notion of precision weighing, which basically has your brain, given context, kind of turn down the, the, the volume on, your, on certain prediction errors and turn up the volume on other prediction errors. And that turns out to be a really important aspect of predicting processing. So that's another part of the domain of predicting processing. Now, it's not just about perception. It turns out that predictions play a really important role in action. When you're about you want to grab a glass, right? Actually, what happens is that you, your brain predicts that you are holding the glass already. Of course, sensations from your hand and, and interoception, proprioceptive uh, signals come in and say, no, you're not. And then you have this flurry of prediction errors. And then your motor co cortex responds to these prediction errors by moving the hand so that now the sensations from the end are indeed those of holding a glass. And the predictions er prediction errors are gone. So actually, whenever you move, it's, you're doing self-fulfilling prophecies. So that, that's, that's really cool. And actually, all these things will end up in the robot, by the way, in some way. So where do these predictions come from? We talk about predictions, predictions. They come from something called generative models. A generative model is a model of part of the world that's capable of generating instances of that world, right? Just, uh, you're not just recognizing and classifying things with your model, you're actually generating instances from that world. In, in the world of predictive processing, what the instances are sensory predictions. So the generative models actually are is where your predictions are generated. In essence, your brain is generating all the sensations you will have, eventually, living in the world. And those sensations, the generative models can be at a very high level. You know, I'm seeing a horse. At a very, very low level, this dot light is going to cross my retina in this direction. And they, they all combine together uh, to generate that sense of perception and also to generate your, your actions. So it generates prediction errors, sensory data come up, and then prediction errors are produced, and that becomes a sensory data that flows to the next level up. Okay, so that's... I re, I, 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 I'm reading this, I'm thinking how oh, I'm going to do that for my robot, but it, it, it turns out that that would be really great because that's where learning happens. The most important kind of learning happens because whenever prediction errors hit the, the generative model, generative model says, whoa, I better make better predictions that next time for the next incoming you know, cycle of, of sensations. So it will adapt and generate better perceptions, hopefully, and then cancel out more prediction errors. And this happens in a rolling way as, as, as you experience the world. So that, that's really cool. Except it's a super hard research problem right now. How do you implement that? You know, It's like cutting edge. I have just a few months to do something and come and present it here. So that's, that's not an option. So I'm hoping maybe there are other opportunities for introducing learning into this whole predictive processing model. And it so happens that there are. Now, last slide about predictive processing before we get into the robot itself. There are really, really cool things that predictive processing 
uh, can explain. For, for example, imagine that you turn off all the prediction errors. You're asleep, right? You're asleep. You're not moving. You're not sensing. Your eyes are shut. You're essentially paralyzed. So there are no prediction errors being produced. But your brain is very active making predictions. So you dream. And they feel real because what you do during daytime is you're actually dreaming, but your dreams are constrained by reality. You are always hallucinating all the time. When you're dreaming, you are hallucinating, but there's no reality to keep your hallucinations in check. Right? So that's why a dream feels extremely real, even though in your dream you might be flapping your arms and flying in the sky, like I, I like to do. But, so that's, that would explain dreaming. What about if your, um, your, your neural machinery is somewhat skewed so that the predictions are super strong and prediction errors are not generated when they should? Well, you are hallucinating awake now. And that might be one of the symptoms of schizophrenia. It could be explained with uh, prediction, predictive processing. What if the inverse happens? What if your predictions are really weak and, and, and the sensory input uh, is not canceled out by them and just like rushes to your brain? Now everything is new, everything is novel, everything is surprising. It's overwhelming. Well, apparently that might be an explanation for uh, autism. So th this, this delicate balance, this interplay between the, the strength of, 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 of the sensory input, the strength of the predictions, whether they cancel out or not, it, this, this very delicate balance can go askew. And actually, even when it doesn't go askew, that's something we tune, up, we tune all the time in our um, daily life. So there's a lot that can be explained with predictive processing, and it's a very exciting uh, subfield of neuroscience. OK, now I'm, I'm totally excited about predictive processing. I like the fact that, that learning is, is built in. So my new obsession is, OK, I'm going to draw some in my inspiration from it, right? And I'm going to come up with a, a, a domain model, a cognitive model, with learning built in. That's, that's what I want to do. That's all I can think of, pretty much. Um, I'm going to apply it to a, my new robot, so that, and my test is that it should be able to do pretty much everything that the old robot could do, plus it learns. That's my goal, OK, my new obsession. And so let's just right away meet uh, uh, my robot. It's, uh, it's a new robot. It's more powerful than the old one. It's uh, running a, on a Raspberry Pi 3 with a brick Pi port, which, uh, board, which allows me to plug in uh, Lego AV3 sensors and motors. A Raspberry Pi is a quad-core, 1.4 uh, gigahertz. It's got some good computing power. Um, I need two battery packs to run it one battery pack to uh, power the um, uh, Raspberry Pi, and one battery, battery pack to power the motors. That makes my robot a little bit tough heavy. So you'll see it, it, it I, I've lowered the speed a little bit, because if I go too fast, it just tips over. All right. It has, the, it has a speaker now. It has an external speaker. And it'll have two motors for uh, going forward, backward, and turning. Uh, there's a medium motor which simulates the mouth. It's whenever it chews, the motor runs. There's going to be a touch sensor to detect collisions. There's going to be a, a color, an ambient sensor, to detect uh, how dark or light it is in the room and whether we're over the food, which would be a, a blue sheet of paper. Um, there's an infrared sensor. And the infrared sensor basically locates the, the beacon. And the beacon simulates the scent of the food. Okay? There's an ultrasonic sensor to gauge how far it is from uh, an obstacle. And of course, the infrared bacon, beacon, not bacon, beacon, but it simulates bacon. All right, it's July. I read the book, you know, and I need to take a first crack at the domain model. You've had that feeling that how do you cross that chasm? All these wonderful English worded sentences and descriptions and high level, you know, explanations of predictive processing, and I have to do something that actually runs, can be coded and runs on a robot. There's a chasm. So anyway, I, I do about two or three iterations of the domain model, and I got something that I think is quite solid. Well, here's my domain model, the data part of it. So um, I'll go very briefly. 
my robot has a profile. And a profile is a set of conjectures. Now, a conjecture is like a generative model, except the predictions are fixed. They don't learn. They don't change. Conjecture is a hypothesis. I am safe. I am well-fed. I am free. Conjectures. In order to prove that this conjecture is true, we have a bunch of predictions. Each conjecture has a list of predictions. And it could be predictions that uh, I, I believe in another conjecture. Like, if I am safe, I believe I'm not bumping into something. Or it could be about something that I've, 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 I'm sensing. I, I predict that I will sense that I'm in a well-lit area of the room. Or it could be predictions about what has happened. I have moved recently. I have eaten recently. Now, should a prediction not be proved to be true, be fulfilled, then there's such a thing as a fulfillment. And a fulfillment for a prediction is a list of options on how to make the prediction true again. And there could be a sequence of actions, moving around, or it could be a belief in another conjecture, and fulfilling that, that prediction is make that belief come true. As you can see, this is recursive, right? The conjecture is defined in terms of predictions, which are defined in terms of conjectures. So it's, it's a recursive hierarchical model. OK, fine. So far, so good. Let me just open a parenthesis about how I'm going to be implementing this, because it, it has a, a definite impact on, on, on the design, and in particular, I'm using the actor model. And the actor model, uh, every actor is a process. It has its own state. It doesn't share it with anyone. And it only communicates with other actors by sending messages, by putting messages into their mailboxes. No data is shared. An actor goes down, doesn't impact the other actors. Right? I'm going to use functional programming because of all the goodness of immutability. And I'm going to rely extensively on, uh, on events, publish and subscribe. Because all the various parts of uh, the, the brain of my robot are not going to be coupled together. They're going to be completely decoupled. And they're going to find out about stuff only through events, publish and subscribe. The language I'm using is Elixir, which is a programming language that implements all these things and, and very well. And that closes the parenthesis. Now let's look at uh, my uh, domain model from the actor's point of view, or agents, as we say in, in, in Elixir, and how they correspond to my data uh, model. For each conjecture, I'll have a believer. And the job of the believer is to verify if we are actually believing in that conjecture. And that believer will be managing a bunch of validators, one for each of its predictions. And the validator's job is to see if the prediction is fulfilled. Uh, if not, generate a prediction error. If so, generate a prediction fulfilled. These are events, by the way. And if it's not fulfilled, then uh, engage and use one fulfillment option, execute it, Hopefully, that will fulfill the prediction. So believers, one believer by conjecture, and one validator by, per prediction. Now, there's experience. An experience is an, a single agent, and its job is to listen to these prediction errors and its predictions fulfilled, and kind of accumulate statistics about what worked and what didn't. And based on what worked and what didn't, it will suggest a fulfillment option to the validator that just reported the prediction error. So basically, experience is where learning is going to happen. Right? It learns from experience what fulfillment options worked and which one didn't. So that's pretty cool. Attention. Attention is another agent. is only one in the system. And its responsibility is to turn, uh, on, to, 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 to turn on and off detectors. Because only certain validators will need to be op operating at any point in time. So only certain uh, perceptions are necessary to be uh, generated. Now, only a certain set of perceptions matter. And we have one detector for each sense for each sensor. So there's going to be one detector for the touch sensor. There's going to be two detectors for the color sensor, because the color sensors can detect either color or ambient light, so forth. So detectors. 
actuators. Actuators are responsible for actually getting the robot to move. You know, there's going to be one actuator per type of actuation. It's going to be a locomotion actuator, it's going to be a speech actuator, and whatnot. Memory grabs all these events that happened, memorizes them, and forgets the old one, and then reports whenever there's a new memory that just came in. And finally, focus, and we'll see that in more detail uh, later, is responsible for uh, giving more precedence to a believer. If, uh, if re restoring belief in, 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 in being safe is more important than restoring belief in being free, then we're going to favor you know, uh, being safe. As, we're going to give it all the resources it needs first. Okay. Now, let's look a bit at uh, the conjectures that have been defined uh, for Andy. And uh, this is the only Elixir code you're going to see. Okay, so don't, don't be worried. Uh, and, and this code is very simple. It just constructs a data structure, the conjecture data structure. So the, uh, this one, thriving, uh, is a conjecture that the puppy is safe, has eaten recently, and can move about. Makes three predictions that the puppy is safe. And how do we prove that the puppy is safe? Well, if we can believe in the conjecture safe, then good, the prediction is fulfilled. Uh, Puppy is sated, same thing. We fulfill it. We, we believe that the puppy is safe if we believe that the, the conjecture sated is true. And we'll see. It's also defined. For free, same thing. So these are, those three predictions are about believing in other conjectures. And then, uh, let's leave it at that for now, and just say that it, it's a hyper-prior, as the bottom we see hyper-prior, it's a hyper-prior conjecture, which just means it's a root projecture. Conjecture it means it's, it's always on, okay? It's never off. Then we have um, puppy is safe. Puppy is safe if we believe that it has not bumped. So we don't believe in the conjecture that the puppy has bumped. And how do we fulfill that? If this is wrong, the puppy is bumping, it's got its nose on the wall. How do we fulfill that? Well, we have action sequences, but here it's a, genera it's a generator of action sequences. We're going to pick two out of back off, turn right, turn left, and go forward. So maybe one, one uh, fulfillment option is to back off and to turn right. Maybe another is to turn right and to back off. Maybe it's back off and go forward. Well, that wouldn't be very useful. You're just like bumping again to the wall, but that's okay. We're just going to offer all these fulfillment options and let experience figure out which ones work. And at the bottom, puppy, puppies in the light, um, fulfill, by, uh, fulfill when is an interesting line here. It says, worry about this prediction only when the other two predictions have been fulfilled. Don't worry about proving that the puppies in the light are not until you've proven that it's not bumping and it's not about to bump. Okay. Okay. And bumped, well, you're, you're, the, the, the conjecture that the puppy has bumped into something, is true if you've perceived the touch sensor. The last time you perceived the touch sensor, it was pressed. That's what it says. And in order to, to fulfill, when you're, you fulfill this, you just say, ouch. So, oops, I bumped, so the robot's going to say, ouch. All right. About to bump. Um, here it's a little bit more complex. Uh, it's one prediction that the puppy's about to bump. Uh, and it, in order for that to be true, the, the ultrasonic sensor must feel that it's near to an obstacle. In this case, near is about 15 centimeters. It's been near to the obstacle in the past fa two seconds, right? And that, that distance has been going down for the past five seconds, which means we're getting close, we're close and getting closer. That's what it says. Now, precision. Here, medium. And by medium, it says, I want this to be true-ish. I want 60% of all the percepts that match this to, f to be, yes, it's close, and yes, it's getting closer. But not all of them, just 60%. If the precision was high, it would be 80% or more. If it was low, it would be 30% or more. So I can tune you know, by how much I, I want this to be, how much precision I want in my... In, 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 in establishing that the prediction is, is true or not. And then we see uh, priority. The priority is high, but not, we'll, we'll get to priority, priority of a conjecture. So we didn't look at all the, the, the conjectures that are defined, but uh, a few of them, but they, they, they uh, form a hierarchy with thriving at the top. 
So that's our, our hyper prior, right? That's what we care about all the time. The robot is thriving. And it's thriving if it's safe, sated, and free. It is safe if it is, has not bumped, is not about to bump, and is in the light. Now, in order to fulfill Big in the Light, we want to believe that it, things are getting lighter as it moves around. So the, the getting lighter is a, a conjecture that that is being fulfilled. Believe in that conjecture is being fulfilled in order to believe that you know, we're solving the problem of we want to be in the light. So we're going to believe that we're, what we're doing is getting us into a lighter area of the room. Now, safe, sated, and free. Safe, they're sibling conjectures, right? They're both under thriving. But safe as priority high, sated priority medium, and free priority low. And what that means is that if the robot is not safe, let's say, and is not sated and is not free, let's assume, all these three, it will want to re restore safety first, because that's more important than being sated, before, and then if it's true, if it's safe, then it's going to try to restore being sated before it tries to restore belief in being free. So we have a hierarchy. So we have this notion of focus. Focus. The robot is focused on what's more important first. All right. Okay. So, so you get a sense of what happens in the mind of the robot. We're going we're gonna to look at, you know, believers and validators, how they get activated. So as we start, we, f we want to believe that we're thriving. In order to believe that we're thriving, we want to predict that it, we're safe, we're sated, and we're free. In order to predict that we're safe, we want to start a believer called safe for that conjecture, and that one also has its predictions, which have their believers. So you have this tree of, of, of believers and, and validators that are activated automatically at startup. Now, let's remember that it, the, the validator for in is a will-it area. The prediction, I'm in the will-it area, only matters if we've proven that we have not bump and not about to bump. Just keep that in mind. And that has its own uh, believer. Now, let's assume that we just verified that we're not bumping, right? That actually, we're bumping. We're, we are bumping into something. Now, a prediction error, that means that the, the prediction that we're not bumping is false. A prediction error is raised. The believer in, in being safe says, oh, I'm not safe because one of my predictions is wrong. And it will disable one of its predictors because it depends on the other two predictors being true. Now, should the robot move about, and now it's, 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 it's not bumping anymore, now the, the, the prediction is fulfilled that we're not bumping. Uh, the believer uh, in being safe says, OK, my first two predictions are true. Now I can re-enable my third prediction. So there's a lot of that going on. Now, how about paying attention and losing attention in, in the robot? So let's say we have a, a, a believer. The robot is in the well-lit area. And the, uh, the prediction is that uh, there's high ambient light, OK? And uh, we need to perceive, we, we have percepts in memory that says ambient light has been great, is so-and-so is, is over the last 10 seconds. But the important thing here for us is to be true, is that ambient light has been greater than one for the last three seconds. OK. So when we start the believer, it starts the validator, and then what it says, the validator says, OK, I'm, I'm up and running. I care about ambient light. So I'm going to ra raise an event that says, OK, I want to pay attention to ambient light. That event is caught by the attention agent that says, OK, fine. We're going to pull every second the detector for ambient light. So we read. A percept is generated. It's put in memory. Memory says, ah, I have something new here. Validator says, oh, I care about that. I care about this new reading on ambient light. And based on that, I say, aha, good, yes. Uh, my prediction is fulfilled. Okay. Now, if for some reason, as we saw in the previous uh, slide, we want to disable the validator for high ambient light, for example, we are about to collide, we're just collided right now. What happens is that then the validator is disabled, and that will raise an event that says, oh, we're losing attention. We need to lose attention in the ambient. ambient. So we stop polling, and now none of those uh, ambient light percepts are raised. Prediction errors and fulfillment. How does that happen? 
Well, let's see. We have we believe in, in things getting lighter. We have a validator in, 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 in better lit area, a fulfillment, and all that. What we had before. Now, the, um, the detector for ambient light is reading. It raises the percept about ambient light is so and so. Memory got it. Memory says, ah, I got something new. Validator says, I want to, does that you know, make my, my prediction true or false? Oh, it is false. Oops, prediction error is raised. Experience listens to it, says, aha. Uh -huh. It says, OK, validator, why don't you try fulfillment option number one? Why don't you try to turn and go forward as an event? Validator says, oops, there's a new option. I'm going to do that. I'm going to ask the actuator to turn and go forward. M more, that translates into motor commands. We turn. And um, good. And now a new percept is read. The robot has moved into a, a better area of the, of the room. Now it's true that it, it is in the better lit area. Prediction fulfilled, raised. Experience gets it. Aha. Uh -huh. Keeps a note of that. That seems to be a good option. It works. And the robot has learned that what fulfillment option works best to validate prediction. Has a bit more data about it. Now, OK. So now, hopefully, <laughs> if you're not overwhelmed, you have a bit of an idea of what goes on in the mind. Now, all these things happen, multiple agents, in, in parallel at the same time. It's a milestone of events, it's a milestone of agents doing things. Will that lead to reasonable behavior? Well, we're going to look at, at ND before it's learned anything. It starts from nothing. And again, I insist, it's entirely driven by prediction errors. It's completely different from the first robots we've seen before. And it's going to say things like, I'm hungry, I smell food, num da num da num, ouch, I'm scared, it's too dark, I'm OK now. So now you know what it's going to say. So even though the sound's not very good, you're going to use your predictive processing capabilities, and you'll be able to hear it. All right, so let's look at Andy. Can you hear it? All right. I smell food. I smell food. You're not very bright. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's kind of fumbling around. It's too dark. Yeah, it's too I'm dark. Scared. It's too dark. I'm scared. So he's going to do about that. He's going to try to get out, kind of in a better area. I'm okay now. He's okay now. He's not scared anymore. I smell food. And now he's out. He's safe again. Now he can be concerned about being hungry. I smell food. I'm okay now. Oh, I'm ouch. He bumped something. I'm okay now. Okay. Now it's, it, it kind of it, it caught sight of the, uh, the beacon, so it's turning towards the beacon. Or it is. Or is it? Oh, man, this is really, really. Like, I just want to go and slap the thing, you know. But hey, it's learning. Give it a chance, OK? Ah. Wrong way. And he's going to bump something. Oh, it's, it's, it avoids bumping into it. So it, it did reasonably well. I avoid smell food. It smells food again. <sighs> okay. <sighs> he's very hungry by now, as you can imagine. Yeah, it's kind of aiming and moving forward and aiming and moving forward. Ah, come on, you can do it. Come on. It's going to get over the, the blue paper. Nom da nom da nom. <sighs> nom da nom da nom. Ah, good. I'm free. OK, so now he's sated. He's safe. Now he's free. He can move around. First thing he does is go and collide with the food. So basically, he's colliding with his, with his food. Anyway, so that, that, was, uh, that was Andy. Uh, <laughs> thank you. That was ND, not, not knowing much about anything. So I, I, I did 10 runs, two minutes each, and let's see what happens. What is, what is learned from experience? I'm hungry. I smell food. I smell food. 
Much better. Much, much better. Go, Andy. Go, go, go. No hesitation. No distraction. Boom. Gets to the food. Come on. You can do it. He can do it. He does it. No. Nom the nom the nom. He's full. He's free. So he's going to go around. He's approaching an obstacle. You can see that he's going to try to avoid it pretty well. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, not entirely, but pretty good. Still trying to move into the obstacle. Not so smart. He's got a bunch of learning to do still. Ouch. He's scared. But he's backing off pretty nicely from, from the collision. Now he's hungry again. All right. OK, so good. Did better. I mean, he's learned. I mean, um, could learn more, but that was after 10 runs. So hopefully there are other learning opportunities that are there in the model waiting for me to exploit them. Because um, the model is now very, it, the data model is much more small grain than what I had before. I don't have these big finite state machines and, and any of that. It's all very small grain. There's a lot of emergent behaviors happening. And by the way, that's harder to debug in the real world. Actually, it's no picnic. But yeah, there it is. It's, and, and then other forms of learning are possible. I haven't done anything with uh, playing with precision weighing, you know. Um, the, the, my beliefs are just like, like, you're true, you're false, you know, you, you can't, you're contradicted, you're false, you're, you're, it's true again, boom, you're true. What about I introduce some skepticism into the robot? And it's something that's been true a long time, and now some, something seems to say, oh, you have an obstacle in front of you. And we say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, why? Let, let, maybe not. Actually, that would be a good idea because those sensors see ghosts sometimes. They're not always telling me the truth. So it'd be good for the robot to be skeptical. And hopefully, I can go from conjectures, you know, static lists of predictions, and get closer to a generative models, which I generate those predictions. But since the predictions are pretty simple data structures, I could do that, maybe. Maybe. Anyway. Other problems solved by the new model and the old model, that there will be so much data coming in at all times that the robot will be overwhelmed and go, you start reacting to something that happened three seconds, four seconds before. I had to make the robot faint. Then it would just like freeze for about two or three seconds and wake up again. It was, it was a mess. I tried to implement an att attention agent to kind of clear that up, but m it was just like a big hairball very quickly, which tells me that the model was just at a dead end. But not anymore. I mean, the, the attention agent it's, logic is simple. It's beautiful. It's, it's almost nothing. And, and then now with focus control, um, it, the, the robot just attends to one important thing after the other, and, and, and the logic is not hard-coded as much as it used to be. So now the new robot easily keeps up with reality. Now you will say, you know, it's got a more powerful processor than it had before, and I'm sure that plays a big role. But also, if you look at what happens in the robot, there's not a lot of noise. It's mostly signal now, so that's good. Um, I'm just going to skip over this, so it's basically because it just shows, you know, what happens when the focus is, you know, what happens is if it loses being safe and then it deprived and then, then goes on and then finds it safe again and now it says, okay, we can worry about being hungry and then we turn on attention and turn off and whatnot. Okay, that's it. Now, time for a discussion, you know. Now, I, I, I hope that you'll be careful with your questions because last year's, you know, Bruno it threw me into a big loop and I'm barely recovering from it today. All right. So, uh, questions, anyone? Hold on, the microphone is coming. Sorry. Um, so, have you thought about modeling real world things like something like an octopus and communications networking between the robots? Something like one teaching the other, or even going in a direction, I'm going to apologize again for this question of one watching another one with no communication and yes. learning from watching. Is that on the roadmap? Oh, yes, yes, yes. You, 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 that's a great question. Um, first of all, you talked about the octopus. Well, an octopus has a distributed, you know, as you know, uh, cognition. I mean, the tentacles think and act. Oh, I, every agent is a microservice. So distributing, um, uh, if I have motors all the way 
across my, my robot, I can totally distribute uh, uh, in my model the, 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 the cognition, no problem. Now, about uh, multiple robots together, that's actually my next step. You saw that in the previous, last year, I had multiple robots in, you know, kind of interacting together. But it was kind of shallow. But now with uh, the, the notion of, of conjectures and, and, and beliefs and predictions, they, I have the, the raw material to, to implement a model of someone else's mind in one robot. So a robot could start making conjectures about the other robot. What is the other robot trying to do? What is he feeling? How should I f feel about that? What should I do about that? You know? well, how should I react to the fact that the robot, and my, the other robot is, is panicking or is, is eating? Maybe I should go and try to steal the food, right? So yes, there's an opportunity here for using this, this, this domain model to build model of others of other minds. So that I intend to pursue that. Yes, thank you. That's a lot of fun too. <laughs> yes. And I'm sorry, but we're out of time. All right. Well, I'll be outside for questions. And at 2:15, uh, Sergey and I are going to be discussing using the the actor model uh, uh, in in a DDD environment. So come and see us if you have further questions. Thank you very much.